that we were so lucky that those formats demanded the best possible resolution and audiences demanded the best possible resolution. So you did have to go back to the original camera negative. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Margaret Bodie. How you doing, Margaret? I'm doing great, Alex. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I'm excited to have you on because we're going to be talking about film restoration and the work you're doing at the Film Foundation, and as well as some others. You, you do you have a little side hustle that you do as well besides film restoration. So we'll talk about that as well. But the first question I have for you is: How did you get started in the business? That's a really great question because you know, looking back, it all seems so well planned. <laughs> But it was really just a random set of circumstances. I did go to film school, which is, you know, kind of rare in this business. Usually everyone studied history or politics or global studies. Um, but I studied film and um, I my first job out of school was at the Library of Congress. And I was doing archival work at the Library of Congress. I was I was making photographs from either their glass negatives, their nitrate negatives, their, their incredible photographic collection that included, like I said, glass negatives from Matthew Brady to, you know, nitrate, you know, four by fours and two by twos that were um, created during the WPA era. And I remember I was um, I was making both copy what they called copy prints. This is in the days of the old fashioned photographic lab where you would, you know, um, you know, expose the paper and then process it and all these wonderful chemicals that I breathed for about two years. Um, and uh, what happened was I became it was like a master's degree in history, in exposure in, in photography and also by extension in film. And um, so that was, that was an amazing milestone in my career that I hadn't intended really necessarily as, um, as what I wanted to do. And then from there, I went to independent film exhibition. I worked at a movie theater. We booked um, independent films. And so I had the exhibition side of it. And then I went to work, I moved to New York and started work for a fledgling company called Miramax. And I was doing independent film distribution and marketing. And there were about 20 people at the company at that time. So it was early days. Um, and then, um, and I, I worked there for a couple of years. And then I moved into this kind of miracle where I got a call from a colleague who said, you wouldn't want to work for Martin Scorsese, would you? Would you want to be his assistant? And I was like, I would sweep a floor for that guy. Like that was, you know, what a question. So it was, like I said, this kind of random set of circumstances that just now kind of all add up and make sense. But uh, at the time, it was just, you know, you get the jobs you can get that you're interested in. And yeah, exactly. Like, the, I mean, how many filmmakers around the world would like, hey, would you like to to work with Martin Scorsese? <laughs> can you imagine? Doing um, anything, doing anything, right? And, and absolutely anything. So that brings me to my to my next question. I mean, you got to work with him on uh, some, some, not his early films, but early 90s films, uh, like The Age of Innocence, which I absolutely adore. I was f- just obsessed with Age of Innocence when it came out uh, and Casino. So I'm assuming as an assistant and working with him, what did you see on set? Like how, like, I have to ask you the, the, the question that every filmmaker listening wants to know. When you first walked in and met Martin Scorsese for the first time, what was going through your head? How did you deal with it? How did you, I mean, because essentially even at, even in the early nineties, he was still, he was already a legend uh, at that point. He was absolutely a legend. I mean, he had just made, I mean, you good fellas was 1990, right? And then I started working for him on my first night. My first night on the job was the premiere of Cape Fear. That's right. So, you know, it's it's just he was he was to me, he was the 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 top of the mountain, you know. I mean, he was it because he had also started the film foundation in 1990. And when I met with him, which I'll never forget. He lived at the time at the Metropolitan Towers on 57th Street. And so I literally, it's like I went up 
you know, to the, I went up to like, you know, to Mount Olympus, uh, Mount, to Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus, exactly. And I, I, um, I remember, you know, obviously I was, I was nervous, but I, I also was just, I had kind of the attitude of like, I just want to meet this man who has made films that have meant so much to me and so many people. So it was really kind of an experience of a lifetime. I thought whatever happened with the job, I kind of thought this was this wonderful opportunity to meet this, to meet this person. And when I met him, we just really hit it off. He's, he's so warm. He's so smart. He's so funny. He's really like a, just an easy person to, to talk to and get to know. And one of the things that stood out for him with me was, um, oh, so you went to film school, you know, about film, you know, about film history. We just started this foundation. Maybe you can help with that. And so, you know, that was, to me, that was part of this glorious package, you know, of just, you know, being able to work with someone who's an absolute master of the, of the craft and the art of filmmaking and someone who cares about other people's films and also cares about the audience and, and, and making sure that, you know, the continuum of film history is available to filmmakers today and in the future who can look back on the past films and be as inspired by them as Marty has been. That's remarkable. So when you are, so when you're working on uh, age of innocence or casino, what, how do you see him working? What do you, I mean, I'm assuming you're trying to take as much in as you can when you're watching him. Were you on set watching him work? Yeah. Yeah. And you are taking as you're taking it all in, but you know, everyone on that set has this mission, right. And, you know, there you don't have a lot of time for reflection so you're not necessarily you know kind of absorbing and processing you're just kind of like running from like as an assistant especially you're running from one task to the next and your mind is has to be very sharply focused on you know whatever he has you know needs you to do has asked you to do whatever communication you have to give to the various different department heads so i'm not like i wasn't ever involved in like the making of the film it was just there to support all the things that he needed but the 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 set um is an extraordinary place to be with marty because it's so it's such a pure expression of filmmaking where it's all about what do we need how do we get it? He's brilliant about, you know, creating an environment where the actors feel like it's all about what they need to do, where the DP feels like it's all about what he or she needs to do. Everyone feels like they're the most important person in that process. And um, it's just, it's a, it's kind of, a, I mean, you know, not to be, you know, have, I have drank the Kool-Aid. I, I will admit to that, but it is like kind of a sacred place. It's a really exciting place to be, but it's very much, there's nothing frivolous about it. Yeah, it, it, it seems to be. And I mean, I've any filmmaker worth their salt has studied Marty's work over the years. I mean, and, and every documentary, I mean, I remember working at a video store in the eighties uh, and early nineties. And I was, I saw Goodfellas in the theater multiple times. I mean, and you just sit there and you, wait for any making of document back in the day when there wasn't any information about I, I my first laser disc was raging bull <laughs> mm, <laughs> because yeah. I wanted to hear, I wanted to hear Marty's commentary on it. <laughs> you know, right. things, things right. like that is fascinating. There was, there was an early laser disc of the last waltz. I remember that yes. came out like in the er, like mid eighties, early eighties. Mm -hmm. And I remember just, you know, I had seen the last waltz this is aging me quite a bit, but I had seen the last waltz when I was like in, in high school. And I remember just being, it was something very special. I couldn't really articulate it because not a lot of people were making documentaries in that way that weren't verite. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you think about like Woodstock, yeah, you're capturing everything. And that's, that was really what was happening with music documentary um, at that time. Um, and then I remember the last waltz felt like a film. Right. And I, and I remember thinking like, that's interesting. Like, what's really, what's happening? What's, what is he doing differently than everybody else is? And didn't he yeah. also work on Woodstock as an editor? He was, I think he was a, a assistant, or assistant director. And I think he did some editing. 
Yeah, but yeah. Michael Wadley, um, you know, was the director of that film and both Marty and that's where Marty and Thelma, I think, first worked together. Thelma Schoonmaker of was course. an editor on Woodstock. And, um, you know, who knew back in, you know, 72 or whenever that I can't remember the exact year of Woodstock, you know, who knew that that would create this, you know, legendary partnership. No, I mean, is there ever been a, a partnership like that in the history of film that I can think of? An editor that's been, she's edited everything he's done. Um, she Almost. has edited everything from Raging Bull on. So Bull. 1980 on, yeah. A 40, that's a 42 year collaboration. Yeah. It's a lot of, a lot of masterpieces in there. Oh my God, to say the least. Um, now tell me about the work you're doing in the Film Foundation. What is the Film Foundation? Well, the Film Foundation um, was created in 1990, and it really grew out of advocacy that Marty had already been involved in, um, in the after Raging Bull in the in the 1980-81 era. Um, Marty was he started a campaign to get to to encourage Kodak to create a low fade color film stock. And in fact, one of the reasons that Marty made Raging Bull on, in black and white was because he didn't want it to fade in 10 years. And he he was, um, you know, aware of, you know, every filmmaker wants their film to last, right? That's, that's the goal. You're putting, you're putting a work out into the world and you don't want it to go away. You don't want it to look like, you know, diminished, you know, in terms of color and, 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 and degradation after, you know, five or 10 or 15 years, you, you, you hope that it will survive uh, the test of time, as they say. And so he decided to use black and white for uh, Raging Bull for, you know, I mean, artistic reasons, but also for that practical reason. Um, and so after the film was uh, released, he used the press tour um, in Europe and all over the world to talk about this issue of color color film stock fading. And um, thankfully, uh, Kodak did uh, create a low, f- low fade uh, LPP stock, I believe it's called, that, that, would, that would last, if it was properly cared for, it would, it would last for 50 to 100 years with a stable color. You know, the color, the color wouldn't change over time. So he was always thinking about film and the history of film and how much it meant to him and how much it meant to his fellow filmmakers like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and Francis Coppola, Stanley Kubrick at the time. So Marty got these, galvanized these filmmakers and came together and said, look, we'll be so much more impactful if we form this organization and if we use our collective power, our collective clout, to go to the studios, to talk about working in partnership with these archives, these film archives that are in the nonprofit world, who have been collecting negatives, cast off material over the decades. And let's try to build a bridge so these two important parts of the film world can work together to preserve films for the future. And I don't think that there was a a real clear cut concrete plan of how this would get done, but it was definitely um, agreed, you know, with this group and with, with many other people in the field that it, something needed to be done. Something needed to be done because, you know, Marty talks about this story a lot where in the 1970s, when he was living in Los Angeles, he went to a screening at LACMA and it was a it was a fox retrospective and on the particular night that marty remembers there was a double feature of niagara and the seven year itch okay and the seven year itch came the projectionist put up the put up the film print and it came on screen and the entire marty describes the entire audience erupted with booze because the film the print had faded to pink so everything, everything looked magenta. There was no, there was no reflection of what the film was supposed to look like. So you couldn't see like the actor's face. You couldn't see the colors of the set and what what the color design was supposed to look like. And you know, you think about it. That was maybe twenty years at most after the film came out. Not no more than twenty years. So you know, the realization hit 
Marty and, and many other film scholars and filmmakers and, and people who just care about cinema, if this is happening to a huge hit with Marilyn Monroe, right? What's happening to silent films? What's happening to industrial films or, you know, documentaries that were made? We can't just lose all this, you know, at that point, you know, 80, 80 years of, of film um, and, and of our culture. So the, the idea was, let's create an organization that can advocate for film preservation and restoration. And also for this is as important as that is for getting these films back out to the public. Because if, if people, if young people don't know about films from the past, if they don't see them, then what's the motivation to preserve them? So, you know, between the preservation program that we created at the Film Foundation and the education program, we have a curriculum that teaches young people the language of film, the unique language of how stories are told visually. Um, and then um, and then access, you know, we, we make sure that the films um, that we the films that we help fund the restoration of and um, and make sure are preserved, get out to the world through festivals, archives, screenings on, you know, Turner Classic Movies and, and other um, outlets, and also our great partnerships with places like Criterion Channel and the Criterion Collection and, and MUBI and um, many other uh, organizations and companies around the around the world that really present film in, in what is a very kind of like wonderful celebratory and respectful way, making sure that people see the films without commercial interruption and the way that the directors intended them to be seen. I mean, you're doing God's work. I mean, this is this is it is a very, very important um, mission. And I'm so glad that Marty, I think it's, it needed to be someone like Marty to, to be able to spearhead this. You need, you need someone with his kind of gravitas to to let everybody know, hey, hey, wait a minute, we, yeah. need to, we need to keep an eye on this. What I always found fascinating about film preservation uh, is that it is a constant moving target. It mm. never, it never sits. So it's, it's unlike the pyramids um, that will be around for 3000 years. I mean, stone is stone, but film even today we still have to preserve it and continue to move it as technology changes. So even film stock today in 500 years, we don't know if film stock's going to be the way these things are projected. If, if, if that's projection still around, is it going to be on a hard drive? And if it is going to be on a hard drive, how long will that hard drive live last before it crashes? How many, so it's a constant, it's, it's a never ending. So just because you, you, you um, restore a film today, you're thinking, okay, in 30 years or in 20 years or in five, we have to check to see where it is and we have to keep moving the, the ball. It's almost like a game of hot potato. You constantly have to keep moving it along history or along the future. Is that correct? Alex, you're hired. I mean, you know, you, you, you have it, you have it, uh, you hit the nail on the head because, you know, we, we were lucky that we had this technology for what, 120 years or so of film history where yes, the film stock, changed over that time, but it was still um, using light and emulsion to capture life, to capture whatever you want to create and put in front of the camera. And we were also very lucky that, that even as ephemeral and fragile as film is and has been, um, we still have films from the silent era. Oh, yeah. that it's you like, can it's still run, the best. <laughs> then you can run through a projector. You can also hold it up and you can see, oh, yeah, there's people dancing. And then, oh, there's a tint of blue. You know, old films can still be viewed. The issue with digital, and you know, we all know digital is this wonderful innovation. You know, it's allowed a lot of filmmakers who haven't been represented um, in the past to, to make films and get their stories out there. And that's vital. That's, that's, that's an infusion of energy into the, into the whole art form. Um, but the big but on that is digital is untested in terms of the, the, the longevity of digital and the changes in digital technology I don't have to tell you are just 
I mean, the cycle is spinning so fast. Do you remember D1 tape? Of course, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you I'm older than I, I look, Mark. Mar- yeah, like, I remember <laughs> D1 tape. I remember D2 tape. I remember yeah. three quarter inch or one inch or two inch. I, I, I edited I edited one inch between yeah. real to real back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you think about the span, the lifespan of digital is what, 30 years maybe so far? Mm-hmm. How many formats have there been in that really short period of time. So we will be the the archivists of the future and the present are just going to be unraveling that you've got to make sure that you've got um, the hardware that will play back those formats. You've got to be able to, you know, migrate that digital data now every, I mean, they recommend every six months. I mean, but, you know, filmmakers, yeah. And filmmakers are, you know, you, you well, you know, you know, well, when you make a film, you're just on to your next project. You know, most filmmakers don't have the time to kind of like, well, let me manage all my data from my last five projects. I'll take a couple of months here to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's its own challenge. And I don't think that, that um, maybe the industry, maybe the studios, you know, have a handle on that and they're managing their assets, you know, because they have, the budgets for it. And there's um, also, and it's also money. Now they realize that that's ever ending, you know, how absolutely. many, how many versions of star Wars have I purchased? How many versions of Godfather? Every time there's a new version, a new restaurant, you buy a new platform. So from VHS to laser disc, the DVD, the Blu-ray and, and, and digital it, it's constant. So that's where the money is. I think the studios finally caught up. We're like, Oh wait, well, there's money to be made here. <laughs> that was key. That was key. <laughs> Having this, what they call monetized, right? Having having the classic film libraries and collections that the studios had, having another outlet and another way to, like you said, package and release on home home video, home home video, laserdisc, DVD, you know, streaming now. Those that we were so lucky that those formats demanded the best possible resolution and audiences demanded the best possible resolution. So you did have to go back to the original camera negative. You did have to go back into the vaults and take a look at your assets and see if you had the original camera negative, if you didn't have the original camera negative, what were the best elements that you could find so that those DVDs or the, you know, whether it's a SD, HD, 4K, whatever the format is, you're working from, you know, the best possible source for that for that transfer. And I think we were very lucky that there was that robust home entertainment um, market in the in the 1990s and the 2000s. And now with streaming, it's a it's a different it's a different story. I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, because of the business, because it is a business and an art form. Um, you know, there's a different economic model now and it might be harder to, you know, justify, although I don't like to use that word, but a a vast expenditure of money on a single title that may not make that back. Um, I mean, we, of course, you know, that's what we do all day. You know, we, we advocate for that and we try to find ways to, you know, to make that, um, as appealing as possible for uh, studios and other rights holders, because um, you know we think we think of of um, something like film, and this is true in with books and 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 paintings and you know other art forms, um, music and and theater. You know, people can't really own it, right? You're a bit of a custodian. Right. Right. We can't we can't own anything. We're only on the earth for a certain amount of time. So even land, you you eventually have to give it to somebody else. It's like we're yeah, just here for yeah. a moment of time. So if you have, let's say, let's say, what's your favorite film, Alex? Oh God. Um, or one of your favorite. Films. I love Shawshank Redemption. I love Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption. Redemption. Okay. So let's say you obtain the rights to Shawshank Redemption, right? Mm-hmm. You, you know, you have the rights to it, but you know, I would argue that you are also holding it for the rest of us too, right? I, I, I'm not gonna put, if I bought, it's like, imagine if I got the rights to, to Shawshank, I would like, I'm putting it in my vault, only I can see it, all copies have taken off the shelves, 
No one could ever see it again. No, yeah. you're a custodian of art for the wor- for the good of the populace, the good of the world. That's what you should. That's how film should be. How the, and arguably that's how studios should be as well. But with them, it's a business now because, it's, you know, as you know, yeah. the corporations have taken over the main studios before it was run by filmmakers. Yeah. Uh, and now it's more more corporate. Yeah. I mean, it's always been a business. And I think that's part of the challenge, I think, with the film, with film as an art form and a commercial, I I won't say product, but as a commercial endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Films were made for the weekend and the months that they could be in the theaters. And then really until television, there was no... (laughs) There was no maybe there would be a, a re-release, re-release maybe ten years of the later big ones, of the hit of the hit ones of the hit ones yeah yeah but what about the every B picture and you know until television came along it was considered you know disposable is a strong word but it was considered that's an old movie what are we what are we putting out you know next weekend what are we putting out next year mm-hmm. um, and that and that is just by nature the way that the, that the movie business, you know, works and, and it makes sense because, you know, you, you know, your profits are only in the future and only on your current films, everything is pretty diminished once it's um, made its initial run. So yeah. These are, yeah. These are the challenges I think in terms of trying to, you know, balance, you know, fill the high minded, notion that film is an art form and needs to be protected and preserved and the reality of you can't spend a million dollars restoring one film you know that's not no one's gonna you know no one's gonna it's it's not really you know necessary most of the time and it's not something that a studio is going to put that kind of money in so we we do what we can and we make sure that we try to get both the kind of the the high-minded advocacy and awareness out there and then also work practically to try to make sure that these as many films that can be restored in any given year can get restored and i've i've heard lately that there is you know you work with film and films from 90s back from 1990s and back from what i understand from your um from my research uh but there's an issue now with movies created in the 80s that now the best quality versions of them are vhs tapes like that's the, all the negatives are gone because they were so disposable in those kind of b movies and you know these kind of things but it is still cinema so i know there's a lot of organizations trying to even save vhs tapes because that's yeah. or laser disc might be the best version yeah. of it out there so it is a problem it is a problem we're yeah. losing our we're losing movies Every day. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the 80s were this, I mean, especially with what you do, right? The 80s were, this was kind of the golden era of independent filmmaking. That's 80s and when, 90s, yeah. yeah. 80s and 90s. I mean, that's when, um, you know, Jane Campion and Spike Lee and uh, John Sayles and, and Mira Nair, you know, all these, amazing, Jim Jarmusch, all these amazing independent filmmakers that you think of as these, you know, kind of legends, right? They were making movies for small companies. And there were a lot of very successful small companies like Cinecom. And that's when Miramax started mm-hmm. and um, uh, um, New Line, you know. New World. There were these <laughs> new World. I mean, we could probably, if I dig back in my memory banks, I could think of even more. I mean, even, even you know, Sony Pictures, Sony Pictures Classics. No, mm-hmm. Orion. Orion class. Oh, Ryan. Ryan. Let's not forget Canon. <laughs> and Canon, right? And Troma. <laughs> oh, okay. Forget Troma. Okay. Forget Lloyd. <laughs> so, you know, and, and when those companies then no longer, you know, were no longer in business, you know, those collections, it's, it's, it's unclear, you know, where they bought, who, who bought them. And I've talked to, you know, so many filmmakers who say, I don't know where my elements are. For, for that hit, for that, for that independent film hit that I, that I made in, you know, in the mid eighties, you know, and they have maybe a 16 millimeter print of it. You know, if they're lucky, they have a 35 millimeter print of the film, but those are, it's like detective work. Mm-hmm. You have to follow, you have to trace everything back. You know, was it at a lab that closed? Did then those materials go to an archive? Hopefully they were okay. saved and they're yeah. in an archive. Um, it, it, it was that, 
was that collection then sold outright to like maybe a television company? You have to trace all those things back. And I do think that archivists, you know, do have a, a certain kind of detective gene that they that they tap into where they track these films down. I'll tell you a story, an interesting, this is just one example of many. Um, when we, you know, we work very closely with all the different archives in, in the U.S. and around the world. And we have a great partnership with the UCLA Film and Television Archive. And uh, at the time, there was an archivist working at UCLA, Ross Lippman. And he was, uh, as they often do, he was, he was made aware that, uh, you know, got a call from a lab. We're closing. We're getting rid of all the stuff here. You got today to come by and, and find whatever you want. Pick it up. Oh, my God. So he and his team go over to the lab and they're looking through the material and there's all these elements, all these film elements, and some of them have proper labeling. Many of them don't. And he finds on the label, the name of a, of a New York based producer. And he just thought, you know, that guy produced the one film that Barbara Loden made Wanda that she, that she starred in directed, wrote and directed um, and it's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's, it's considered this kind of independent film, you know, milestone and in, in independent cinema and, 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 you know, feminist, you know, films made by my, by uh, women. So, you know, he, he takes it, he puts all these elements in his trunk. It turns out this was the original negative for the film Wanda. And were it not for the archivist, the knowledge that this archivist had the the kind of random serendipity of you know the lab thankfully calls the archive materials are gathered thrown into his trunk and the you know, contact the film foundation that was one of the films that they asked us to support the restoration of in that given year and you know now that film has inspired so many people who hadn't they would never be able to see that film in the way that that it exists now restored and saved for um, filmmakers and, and and audiences to to you know get inspiration and and um, joy from these films. Yeah, it's it's remarkable. I know there was a movie that Marty found. Um, at least the legend goes uh, there was a wonderful film called I Am Cuba mm -hmm. um, years ago. Um, I'm Cuban of Cuban descent, so I was very interested in watching that film. And then it was released through Criterion. I think it released once and then really re-released through a criterion and it was him and, and francis who presented the film and they said i remember i remember the, the, the when it came out everyone was like if this movie would have come out when it was made it would have changed cinema like it, it would have skewed cinema in a certain direction like there are those landmark films that when once that comes you're like well everything's changed yeah. um and it was in it was i think it was found in in, in a closet somewhere, I don't know, in an archive somewhere, in a salt mine somewhere. Uh, and when they saw it, they, it, it was just a game changer. And, and any filmmaker listening, if you haven't seen I Am Cuba, please go out and see I Am Cuba. I mean, P.T. Uh, Anderson, you know, he he borrowed a very famous shot from that. And he says, I was inspired by this shot in I Am Cuba. And the stuff that they did in a film like that, like you're looking back, you're like, they're running around with, a hundred pound camera and it looks like it's a steady cam, but it isn't. How do yeah. they do that? How do they hang the camera over these two? Like this is, this is cinema at its yeah. best. And, but it was lost. It was gone. Yeah. 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 And you know, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, people, you know, filmmakers and there's not many of them, right. Filmmakers like Marty and Francis Ford Coppola putting attention, putting a spotlight, on these right. films has been a really crucial part of this whole movement, right? The film preservation and appreciation movement. You have filmmakers who are beloved and masters putting a spotlight on a film like I Am Cuba or a film like, um, you know, even even a big popular film like um, I think when when Marty and Steven Spielberg, I think did the first Lawrence of Arabia restoration. 
way back in the photochemical era. And I remember going to the Ziegfeld and, and watching it on that big screen. I had never seen Lawrence of Arabia. And, right. and, it, and I just, you know, I remember one of the main reasons I went to see it was I knew that like Martin Scorsese, a filmmaker that I love, who I just, if he likes this film, <laughs> I want to go see it. And it's obviously a masterpiece. So directors, filmmakers who, you know, are generous in that way. And I think they instinctively are because, you know, when something hits you in a profound way, you want to share that. Mm -hmm. And I think if the film foundation has been successful over these years, um, I think that's, that's, it's really all because of Marty and the other directors on the board who have generously shared their enthusiasm for these films and their, and their dedication to making sure, I mean, they have a righteous anger about like, you know, let's not lose these films. You know, we don't, we don't know who is going to be hit by these films and inspired in the future. And it's a, it's a, it's a deep well that I think we have to make sure, you know, stays available for filmmakers who, um, you know, are working today and who are going to be working in the future. Exactly. I mean, how many painters and artists have been inspired by Van Gogh or Basquiat or Pollock or any of these, like, just imagine if Van Gogh would have never been found. Like, thank God he made 900 of those things. Uh, he just kept making them and no one bought them, but he just kept making them because he had to, because he was an artist. But imagine if that was all lost in a fire one day, and no one would have known about Van Gogh. Yeah. What a loss to humanity. Yeah. Um, that would be, and, and I think and that's I, how you look at it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also kind of interesting because film inspires filmmakers, but it also inspires painters and musicians and dancers and scientists. And, you know, I mean, people, it, I think, people. And, and, and yeah, because I, I think if you, if you look at art, and cinema art and, and, you know, fine art, if you look at it as a transcendent experience, I mean, it's really one of the things that makes life worth living, you know? I mean, we, we, we transcend our daily lives when we read a book or when we look at a painting or when we watch a great film and when we, you know, experience a dance that we're seeing, you know, performed. These are things that, um, take us out of the daily, you know, grind of, you know, working. And, you know, I mean, I think that we have to remember that there are so many important issues in the world, but this is, this is a vital thing that we want to really keep alive and keep available to people because it's what kind of propels us into the future in a, in a kind of renewed way. Well, and, there's no, it, it, there's no question because, then there's a conversation about the arts. You know, that's the first thing they cut at school uh, when the budget's going like, but art is what makes your mind think, what creates insp what creates imagination. And that is what creates innovation uh, in our, in our, in, in humanity without the great scientific or the sci-fi books of HG Wells. A lot of that has come true. Yeah. We don't have a time machine yet, but there's a lot of concepts that, that were laid out there that were inspired, inspired scientists. And they wanted to go. And then, I mean, and then many of the filmmakers we've spoken about today have inspired so many scientists, so many artists, so many people in the world. Art is something that needs to be preserved and needs to be protected. And uh, even if there isn't a monetary um, reward right away, yeah. there's a much greater reward, which is the culture of it. And mm -hmm. I always tell people, you know, when I, when I try to inspire filmmakers to, to go out and make their films, I go, you have no idea who you are going to touch what your film, your film might be seen by 10 people, but one of those 10 people might go off and make the great cinematic masterpiece or might go off and become that doctor because of the story that you're telling or, or go off and save lives or change. You have no idea the power that art has in changing people's lives. And that's why mm -hmm. I think the work that you do and Marty's doing is so, so, so important in the world. Well, I have to say that um, we're a small team. So I, I want to take a moment to Please. give a shout out to um, the other uh, three or four people who work work at the foundation with me. Jennifer Ahn is um, our managing director. She's been at the foundation for over 20 years and she's, you know, kind of a genius in many ways in terms of 
creating programs, creating partnerships with people who will, you know, help fund these restorations. And she's truly a partner for Marty and I, and she's just you know, an extraordinary talent. Um, and Chris, Chris, Mar- Kristen Marola, who's our um, program manager, who is just, you know, again, just so dedicated and devoted to film and cinema. Mm-hmm. And is just, you know, there's no one who can keep more, things in the air at the same time. Um, she's terrific. And um, uh, my uh, colleague here in New York, Rebecca Wingle, who's actually moving on to grad school, we're, we're sad to see her go, but she's been with the foundation for six years. So we're kind of a very small and, and kind of dedicated group that, um, you know, we're lean and mean and we make a lot happen. So I just want to give a shout out to my colleagues at the foundation. Absolutely. No question about it. Now I, I have a question, a few questions I want to ask you that are kind of the nitty gritty of, of actually film restorations. We've talked about the ideas and the concepts and the love about it, but how long does it take to restore a film? Well, it, it varies depending on the condition of the materials, the length of the film, um, the type of, of uh, workflow that you um, decide. Um, the first, the first thing you want to ask is like, is this the is this the original negative? Is this the best um, element to work from? If it's if the original negative is damaged, if it doesn't exist, if it's missing reels, that time to track down and to kind of bring together all the best surviving elements for a film can be very time consuming, but it's really crucial because you don't wanna spend resources and time preserving something that you think is the best element. And then, oh, you know, this archive in, um, you know, uh, in Germany, they have this whole film and it's, it's a better element than what you're working from. So this consortium of archives um, in, in, under this group called FIAF, the International Federation of Film Archivists. Um, They're really crucial in this process. The archives will do these calls around the world to make sure that they're working from the best best material. So that's a a long way of saying it can take a long time. However, if you have an original camera negative that's in, you know, really good or decent condition, and you know that you're going to do either a photochemical preservation or a digital restoration, um, you know, it can be, it can be as short as, you know, two to four months, you know, if you can really focus on that. And if the, if the, if you don't have to track down materials, if you don't have to do a lot of physical repair and manual work on, on the film itself. Um, we've worked on projects that take 10 years. Wow. And that 10 year time frame is from the time that someone first starts talking to you about, Hey, and in this instance, I'll tell you what the project was. Um, one of Marty's oldest, dearest friends, Jay Cox. Every time I would see Jay, Uh, and he's a renowned writer, he would say to me, we got to save the memory of justice. It's this Marcel Ophel's four and a half documentary on Nuremberg, Vietnam, and the French-Algerian War. It's a masterpiece. We have to save it. No one can see it. So from that instigation, right, you have to then find out In the instance of this project, it was the subject of various lawsuits. Um, It was, uh, you know, bought and sold. Um, There was only a 16 millimeter print at the New York Public Library. And so we had to do tracking down, finding, you know, the original 16 millimeter. It was made on 16 millimeter, 16 millimeter negative. Um, in this instance, we had to, which is one of the only times the Film Foundation has ever had to do this, we had to go back because it's a documentary and it had like 380 cues of you know clips, music. Oh. Clips. We had to go back and re-license oh. all that material and scan the 16 millimeter negative, do all the work involved in restoring a film of that length. Then we found the original German, French, um, and French language tracks. 
And at the time the film was made, it was, you know, in the 1970s, mid 70s, it was common, a common stylistic um, um, decision in documentaries where you would kind of put the original language track yeah. down or right. take it out entirely and have a very staid British, you know, voiceover. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> yeah. So we contacted, Mar- Marty contacted um, Marcel Ophels, the, the filmmaker, of you know, the, the director of the film, and said, you know, we found these lang- language tracks. What would you like to do? We don't want to change anything about the film unless it's a directorial you know, choice. He said, I always wanted to use the original language tracks. They made me put that um, voiceover on. So what happens when you put the original language tracks and, you know, you're, you, these are interviews with former Nazis, right? So you want to hear the tone of their voice. You want to hear the tone of voice that Marcel Ophels is using to interrogate these guys. And so it's a whole different experience. So we we really look at that. That was a that was a massive undertaking that the Film Foundation um, took on with the Academy Film Archive. And it brought back a work of art, a film, a really important monumental documentary um, to the world where, you know, I don't think anyone could have seen it. And we we were able to work with thank thank you Sheila Nevins at HBO because she loved the film she knew of the film and she was able the the HBO licensed it and we were able to pay for all those licenses so that audiences could see the film because it's an important milestone it's an educational um, tool it's it's a real document for 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 the 20th century so that's just one very long-winded example of right. how long it can take to to fully restore and make a film available to audiences and what is the average cost i know that depends obviously on the the length but generally the average cost of a color film a black and white film that kind yeah. of stuff yeah generally a black and white film is somewhere on the 50 to 80,000 dollar range if it's a feature if it's a feature length film it can be more obviously um, a color film is is more than that it's usually somewhere more like you know 80 to 120,000 dollars for a full feature to do a full restoration where you're really doing frame by frame work um, and again, there, there are, that's kind of a ballpark. There are outliers that are less than that and more than sure. that. Um, but that's the general ballpark. Now, tell me about your monthly on-demand screenings that you guys have just started up. Well, this this is a very exciting opportunity for uh, the foundation to try to reach the audience directly. Mm-hmm. Um, when we when we were in the pandemic and everything was shut down and we had our annual board meeting. The directors, we were talking about all these great festivals that we work with that had migrated online and pivoted to presenting films um, virtually. And also companies like Criterion Channel and Mubi and and, and great organizations and, and also great theaters like the Film Forum and Anthology Film Archives and MoMA. They all had kind of presented their offerings online. And our board said, hey, you know, we should do that you know, once in a while, we don't need to, you know, obviously we're not, we're, there's all these great organizations doing it, but we should show people what we do and the kind of work that we, that we support. And so we went to a a, a wonderful um, supporter uh, who used to be at IBM, Jeff Schick, and is now at um, Oracle. And we, we described the challenge to him and he uh, worked with us as pro bono to kind of build a site that would allow us to present once a month for 24 hours, a fully restored film. And we, we build around each presentation interviews with archivists, filmmakers, actors, um, scholars, historians, talking, contextualizing the experience for an audience and, and, and giving information about the restoration, about the film, why the film, is important to you know any given filmmaker how it inspired them so we're we're creating really kind of like a, a bit of a of a festival experience online for people you know all over the world most of the time i mean it's it depends on film by film we have we have 
more or less territories available, but it's free. And you can look at it, um, if you look at it in a live way, like we, we start each screening at seven o'clock in your local time zone. And if you're in the US or the UK or Canada, you can join us for a live chat if that's the way you like to watch films. If you're seeing a film for, for the second or third or fourth time or for the first time and you just like to talk to people while you're watching a film, um, which is kind of anathema to some people. Um, but you know, we, we have that option. And then we also have an on-demand option for the majority of the people who just want to be able to watch the film either on a large laptop or on their hopefully on their the the television that they have at home where they can cast onto a big screen and enjoy the film. And 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 you know the films you know, look beautiful. You see the restoration. Um, and, and if, if you um, have never seen the film before, you can learn all about the film and um, join in, in, the, in this community that we think is, is still really vital um, every month and see a wide range of films, everything from you know, for the for the initial launch, we showed a, a 1945 British film called I Know Where I'm Going. That's this one of the great romantic films of all time. Um, we showed La Strada, which is, you know, Fellini's masterpiece that we, um, you know, restored in partnership with the Cineteca de Bologna and Criterion. And um, and then after that, we have a wonderful double feature because we love our double features. It's a film noir double feature of The Chase, Arthur Ripley's The Chase, and um, Edgar Ulmer's uh, Detour. Yes. So we're thrilled about, about that because, you know, we really, um, we want to show as many films as possible. So it's, it's fun to be able to show some double features here and there too. And now you're going to be doing this, it's a monthly, it's a monthly screening, right? It's every second Monday of each month. Okay. Yeah, we we just wanted to make it. Um, you know, we don't have the bandwidth with our small team to be doing this. You know, you know, every day. We also have so many great partners who do do this all the time. But we did want to have you know an opportunity to kind of directly connect with an audience and show them the kind of work that we support. We're going to be showing films from our World Cinema Project you know, films that have been, you know, made in regions where, you know, a lot of times these films are really only known in the region that they were made in, like Kumadi and like Samba Zanga, which is a French Angolan Angolan film that was uh, directed by Sarah Mulderer. And it's, um, it's a wonderful uh, film, uh, you know, a political um, film that's, uh, again, being, being discovered and rediscovered because of the restoration. And, um, you know, we're just really thrilled to, to get a real diverse offering of films out to audiences because, um, you know, film is pretty, it's, it's rich and it's broad in, in its um, genres and era, and we want to celebrate all of that. Yeah, and, it's, and you're going to be doing this every, every month moving forward. Every month. Yeah. Moving forward. That's, that's, yeah. that's an amazing service. Uh, I will do everything I can to get the word out to, to my audience. Cause I think it's, it's, it's really, really important for filmmakers to, to watch old cinema. And I mean, we all know the usual suspects we all have to watch, but discovering those, the I am Cubas of the world and those kind of films that are not mainstream classics. Uh, that's where a lot of some really interesting uh, filmmakers are, are, and voices are, are heard that yeah. should be seen by different generations without question. I had one, uh, one question where do, when you, when you're done restoring it now, I'm assuming you put it on celluloid archival cel- celluloid and put it in a salt mine somewhere. And then also digital. Yeah. When, when, when the film, we still do um, photochemical preservations with some of the archives um, in which case you want to make sure that the original materials and elements are held in cold storage, temperature and humidity control, as well as the new film elements. Um, But it allows, you know, film prints to be circulated at theaters that are still showing 35 millimeter film. And then when we have digital workflow and we, when we restore films digitally, um, we always have, uh, we, we have a, a film neg- negative that's output from the digital uh, files and then um, 35 millimeter film prints made from that negative. So we always have a 35 millimeter film print and a DCP available to theaters so that um, audiences can see 
they have, you know, theaters have the option of showing either. Um, and I think, you know, it's important for us to always now have some kind of digital element. So, because that's really the way that the majority of people are going to see the films. Right. So we, we try to kind of, as long as films available, we'll be, we'll be making film prints and, and negatives of the films that we, that we help restore. But there's some, there's some 4k and maybe 8k quick times out there somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, quick times are probably held by the rights holders, but yeah, we, right. we, but, we but, will... but as archival for archival. Oh yeah, stuff. absolutely. Well, LTO tape is usually what yeah. we're uh, preserving. Yeah. LTO. Wow. Yeah. Cause I mean, again, it's, you're, you're fighting against time. Time yeah. is, is, is the enemy here. It's, it just, it just keeps pounding away in these elements. I mean, eventually, hopefully there'll be, uh, a hard drive that will last indefinitely. And I think that will happen one day, but who knows, you know, well, maybe they put well, it on a diamond or something. <laughs> what, what we hear is it's going to be DNA. DNA. So what is that exactly? DNA storage. So what is DNA storage? I have no idea what I've never you know, heard of that. You know, like DNA, brain, DNA, like DNA, big, DNA. Yeah, bigger brains than mine are going to have to explain that. But you should try to get someone on the show who can talk to you about DNA storage, because that's apparently the, the, the future, not just for film preservation and film storage, obviously, but for data storage. I mean, we are creating the the amount of of, you know, computing power needed to store all that's being created on the Internet and, and you know, crypto, everything is just so massive. I think the goal and the future is to have a DNA strand hold all this information. Apparently it's exponential, the amount of material that can be held once you, once you can, you know, so kind of like block, kind of like a blockchain mixed with a DNA kind of world. It, yeah, it's yeah, again, brains bigger than you and I's. Uh, we'll have to <laughs> explain this to people. As smart as we are, it's, yes. it's still a bit beyond us. Right. Well, because you're on the, on the cutting edge of, of everything. I mean, you're talking about, it's kind of like us trying to explain to somebody in the 1900s, this thing right here is really, really important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, <laughs> use it, we use it all day, every day, but we cannot tell you how it works. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. I can tell you. And, I can tell you how a toaster works. I can't tell you how this thing works. <laughs> exactly. Now, Margaret, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Interesting. I feel like I'm still learning things. I, I'm, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I'll tell you what I'm glad I haven't learned yet is the word no. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I I really I I can be kind of a pain in this way, um, but I I don't feel like anything is impossible, and I I try to do you know and and maybe it's because I've worked for Martin Scorsese for over thirty years, but I never I never say no. I, I really try to make things. I'm, I'm tenacious, and I think you need to be tenacious in in you know roles like I have with the film foundation, you, you can't give up on things. You know, how many people are going to like, you know, hang around for a 10 year (laughs) restoration of a 1976 documentary? Um, You know, so I'm trying to think of the less. So I don't know if if you can unwind that into like the lesson. No, no, it it makes it. it, I mean, the the lesson I think that you're learning is to not take no for an answer, which is a a very, very big lesson for people to go. I mean, if you can understand that no is the default, no is what everyone's going to say to you most of the time, especially in the film industry, you know. I'm yeah. sure Marty. I'm sure Marty can t- could attest to that because he's been said no to <laughs> so yeah. many times. I know. I know. And even even now, it's funny because people will say, "Well, he's Martin Scorsese. You can you can do anything." Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, people say no to him all the time. So it's like you know, you you really have to find ways to work around. You know, you have to you have to commit to your dream, whatever it is, if you're, you know, if you want to be an actor, if you want to be a writer, if you want to be a filmmaker, you know, you got to believe in yourself Mm -hmm. because no one's going to believe in you unless they see it coming from you first. Absolutely. No question. That's how it's conveyed. 
Now, I think we might have answered the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What advice do you have for a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? I think this seems like an obvious bit of advice, but know your story, have a story to tell and know what that story is. And, you know, as much as you can draw deep from your own personal experiences, knowledge, you know, bring the emotion to it. And I think that's what people respond to. You know, people respond to the truth of something. And even if it's not like, you know, I'm not talking about documentary truth. I'm talking about something's authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, try to try to make a try to tell a story and make a film about something that matters to you and that you know. Mm -hmm. That's a great piece of advice. And my last question, uh, and arguably the most difficult question you, you can be asked, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, that is really difficult because it changes, as you know. Today, I always say, as of right now, what comes as to your right mind? Now. It, tomorrow will change. Yesterday was different. Right now, what are the three favorite films? Um, I would say... Vertigo, um, and this is in no particular order. I would say Vertigo. Oh, yeah, so good. Um, I would say Mean Streets. I mean, maybe it's... my. I mean, it's a hard. It's a hard call because I have so many uh, Scorsese favorites. Um, you know, I'm really loving 2001. You know? I mean, it's it's. I mean, my my favorite Kubrick. Uh, I'm a huge, huge, huge Kubrick fan. Um, I've gone down the rabbit hole a, a, probably a little too much with with Stanley, but uh, I love Eyes Wide Shut. I just adore. Really, Eyes Wide. Uh, it is not the one that everyone talks about, but for me, I just I still remember walking out of the theater in '99. And my friends are asking me, what did you think? And I go, I don't know. I don't understand it, but I will in 10 years. And that's yeah. generally all of Stanley's movies. They all are understood about a decade later, really, truly, like appreciated. And yeah. then I saw it 10 years later after I was married and it hit me at a whole other level because you're just like, oh, oh God, I understand what he was trying to say. And it's just, it's, it's such a hypnotic film um yeah, uh, yeah. and 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 mean streets there is a there is a rawness and um not velocity uh but like this this energy raw energy yeah. that a young scorsese is making there you know and i've seen i've seen uh who's that knocking or what is a girl a good girl what is a, a nice, nice girl guy like, you. like you're doing in a place like this? Yeah, I saw yeah. that one. I've seen almost all of Marty's they have short films and everything. But Mean Streets has this this raw kinetic, that's it, kinetic energy that you can start seeing the seeds of what's coming. And that's what that yeah. movie is. Such a brilliant piece of work as an it, independent filmmaker. It's really, and, and it, it's, it's the definition of what we just talked about, of like having a story. That's you know, really important to you <laughs> goes deep. That's like a personal, you, you know, these people, you know, this story. Um, I will add um, one film that I, that I mentioned before is, um, you know, I did watch some like it hot again so recently. Good. So good. <laughs> and there are, you know, how many films hold up and make you laugh mm -hmm. so hard every time you see them. Mm -hmm. And over, you know, film was 1960, I think, maybe, mm -hmm. um, you know, however many years, you know, 70 years later, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's a real masterpiece. And, you know, I, I've, I've had a real Billy Wilder reappreciation oh. lately. I mean, I'll tell you, from, from my generation uh, of filmmakers, which was coming up in the 80s and the 90s, laser discs were the thing. And the Criterion Collection introduced me to films. If it just came out in the Criterion Collection, I would be like, I have to watch this. So The Graduates, uh, I, saw, I, I saw movies, classic movies, when there wasn't a lot of information about movies, unless you were in film school in the, like the late eight, in the mid 80s, late 80s, there just wasn't, there's no internet, unless you went out and studied in books, you really couldn't know what was something you should watch and the criterion collection was one of those those collections that you like the graduate okay um some like it hot i saw, I saw some like it hot on laser disc for the first time so that was in these and that collection especially the early stuff 
Uh, and then, of course, Raging Bull, Taxi Driver. I think Bean Streets came out afterwards. And then uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And the list goes on and on. Uh, but yeah, this, those films. Uh, but, but I remember even when I was a knucklehead in the video store days, which I was a teenager, I called myself the knucklehead because I had no taste in cinema. I was learning my taste in cinema. Again, I was watching like, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme films and going, he is the best actor ever. But uh, <laughs> because I was, you know, 16. So of course, you know, but even then films like The Graduate, films like Some Like It Hot pierce through that because it hits you at a whole other level. It's not a superficial level. And that's when I fell in love with Billy Wilder, Preston Sturgis. All It's just these, these filmmakers, those films like Preston Sturgis, Sullivan's Travel still holds. Oh, so well. Yeah, even more, even more. And, you know, the thing is, is it's important to um, note, I think, that comedy is hard. Oh, and, you know, and, we, that, and that it can last for yeah, decades. and we, we think of like oh lighter you know the 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 critics and and awards you know groups I think underestimate how hard it is to make people so, laugh. So hard. And, 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 you know, and you watch a master like Billy Wilder and something like a hot, that's a, an absolute masterpiece. Like it's it's a com- it's a comedic masterpiece. The timing, the actors. Sort of the, the yeah. writing, the, just that everything at the editing, it's just such a well-made comedy. Yeah. And then, yeah, because comedy is like, oh, it's everyone's laughing. So you shouldn't take it seriously. And that's a lot of like awards and, you know, Oscars and these kind of things don't, don't usually award these kind of films, but it's so hard, so yeah. hard. I've, I've worked on comedies. It's the timing. You're talking about a frame here or a frame there. The, the the joke lands or it doesn't land on that frame. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's a, such a nuanced art form. Um, you know, one of my favorite comedies of all time is Airplane. And yeah. I, because of the ludicrous, but that is another deceiving comedy. Yeah. It is so well, t- the timing of the jokes, how yeah. they did it. Um, and you do you know the story of, of their, 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 um, Oh God! What is when when you go in a test audience? The test audience review oh, story. Oh, yeah, you know no, that's. I don't, yeah. I don't so know when that they one. did, it was one of the worst tested films ever. Paramount thought it was going to be a bomb, because wow. n- nobody wanted to admit that they were laughing. Nobody wanted to admit that they enjoyed it because it was so silly, and there was really had never been a film like that. That sl- that true crazy mm-hmm. slapstick. And but then when the audience, when it hit the theaters, it just exploded. But it was, was considered one of the worst tested films ever because nobody wanted to admit oh. that they were having a good time. So it's even then. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness they didn't. Uh, they didn't like. So pull it. I mean, that launched a whole that was groundbreaking. It launched a whole, you know, naked genre. gun. Yeah. The genre the, yeah. The genre the, that didn't exist before. Right. Right. And so these are these are pieces of cinema that, um, you know, in the world that we live in today, Margaret, I, we have so much content and so much information coming at us. And and with, you know, I remember a time, and I always tell, I tell filmmakers this, young filmmakers, I'm like, I remember a time where I could watch everything that came out that week because I was working right. at a video store. And every movie that came out on that given yeah. week, five movies, six movies, maybe, I watched them all. Yeah. I, I, that maybe a, a day. You could take a day and watch everything. Day, yeah. A weekend and you're done. And I would watch everything and I, I would be, you know, that's how I got my cinema knowledge. But today's world, there is so much coming at you. The content and the, and the amount of films, the amount of television, uh, not, and let's not even talk about YouTube and content be created there, but just in cinema and in television storytelling, there's so much coming at us. You and I could spend 10 lifetimes and not watch it all. It, yeah. it, it's, it's insane. So it's that's why it's so important to highlight these wonderful pieces of art that you are working with, uh, with the foundation to, to bring light to, because like content and cinema has become disposable in many Mm -hmm. ways where before, you know, there was only three channels. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I know. Well, no, Alex, it's so, um, we're so grateful for you to, you know, be talking about this to your audience, to be highlighting it, because I think for filmmakers, this is, it, it, it probably is just this really important, I mean, nothing is more important to filmmakers than having that well to draw from, where you can go back and be inspired by a film that was made 
that's part of that legacy. It's part of the continuum of, of the creative evolution of storytelling on film. Right, exactly. And I, can, I, I can't imagine a world without the the filmography of, of Martin Scorsese or Stanley Kubrick or Steven Spielberg I mean, or Hitchcock or Kurosawa. You pulled these, just those, those names alone or Coppola, you pulled them out of cinema. Can you imagine the next generation of filmmakers without being able to see Mean Streets or Jaws or 2001? Yeah. yeah. I mean, nothing exists in a vacuum and, you know, you can't have, you know, uh, you know, you can't have, you know, fill in the blank contemporary filmmaker without their antecedents, you know, without, without the things that came before them, because everything it's, it builds on it. It's music is the same way. Any art form, it echoes the past and, and then creates something new. Right. You know? exactly. Like we're not, we're not mimicking the past. We're using, you know, we're, we're kind of building on that and, and, you know, using your own voice and your own story, but, always having that awareness of what's come before. Margaret, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor talking to you. Thank you so much for for coming on the show. And thank you, Marty, and your entire team at the Film Foundation for what you do, because it is such important work. And I'm so glad that, that I can, in my small way, help you along the way. So thank you again. And please continue the good work. You are doing God's work without question. Thank you, Alex. It's been such a pleasure. And hopefully we'll be back and talk about other uh, restorations in the future. 